this morning. It's just as well, perhaps, though, it's going to be an easy sermon. Uh, if you thought last week the message was tough, it, this one is tougher. Is that a word? Tougher? Yeah, that's a word. It's more difficult to me. I promise you that much. All right. So let's read together. We finish out chapter 18 uh, this morning. We begin this morning in <clears throat> verse 25. Uh, no, verse 21, excuse me. Verse 20, it's right there in front of me. Verse 21. And I would ask the congregation to stand as we read God's Word together this morning. Matthew 18, verse 21 through verse 35. You follow along silently as I read out loud. Then Peter came up and said, Peter's always coming up and saying, that's his nature. Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? That's a fancy way of saying, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Or seventy times seven times, some of your <coughs> translations may read. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants... And when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, begging him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when the same servant, when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. That's a considerably less amount of money. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. And so his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. And he refused and went and put him in prison until, until he should pay the debt. And when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. And then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt, or all that debt, because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from all your heart. Um, again, I would remind you that this is a reading uh, that has been preserved for us for over 2,000 years. The words we have read this morning were written under the very inspiration of the living God by a man named Matthew as he recorded the very words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I ask you to receive them as such. Let's pray. Once again, Heavenly Father, we come to you and we realize that we are utterly dependent upon you to take our meaning of this text and to understand it and to believe it and to obey it. And I recognize this morning, Lord, that that is not going to be an easy thing to do, nor is it ever an easy thing to do. As a matter of fact, 
Father, I pray that you would help us today, that you would take away our stiff net stubbornness, that you would soften our hearts, that we might not only hear and believe, but that we might obey, and even further than that, that we might love what we are obeying because we are loving the very Master who said it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Sermon title this morning is, How Many Times Must We Forgive? How many times must we forgive? And actually, that's a play on words, and I'll attempt to explain that in just a minute. But first, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been offended? Uh, let me expand on that because when I ask that question it sounds a little pious, it sounds a little churchy and you might be thinking something that is not my intention. Has anybody ever done you wrong? There, put it in the modern vernacular. Has anyone ever wronged you? Has anyone ever told you something that was hurtful? Or done something to you that was hurtful? Or taken something that belonged to you? Or sinned against you in some way? Maybe physically hurt you? Maybe mentally hurt you? Or emotionally hurt you? Anyone ever wronged you? Now, asking the question is really absurd because the fact of the matter is that everybody in this room has been hurt. Everybody in this room has been wronged to some degree or another. As a matter of fact, we have been wronged multiple times. And on a scale of wrongness, we have been wronged all up and down that scale. Some people have wronged us in a very minor way in a very insignificant way, and we don't ever think about it. Some people have wronged us in very significant ways, and it has crushed us, and it hurts us even now to this day. And we know these things. Well, let me just put all of my cards on the table this morning, because I want to be very simple this morning, if that's possible for me. And I want to be very direct this morning, which is probably possible for me. And so let me just put my cards on the table and say this. As a Christian, even when you are wronged, even though you will be wronged, as Christians, you are required to forgive the offender. There's no question about it. That, and you, I can almost hear the objections are, yeah, okay, yeah, I can, but, 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 but not for this. You know? Listen to me again as I lay my cards once again on the table. Every time someone comes to you, Mr. or Miss Christian, every time someone comes to you and says, please forgive me, you are required to forgive them. Okay, well, I'll forgive. How many times have I heard this one? I'll forgive, but I won't forget. And guess what? You have not forgiven. Now, I don't mean that you need to literally forget it, but that's not what you mean. That, that's not what you, you don't mean I'll forgive, but I won't have my, my mind erased of the incident. You mean I'll forgive, but I'm still going to stick it to you in terms of in my mind, I'm still going to hold you accountable for it. That is not forgiving. It would be stupid if I owe a debt to the bank, which I do. Well, I don't know how much it is, but I still owe money to the bank for my house. 
That would be crazy if I go down there to the bank, and let's just say I owe them $15,000 for my house, and I write them a check and give them $15,000, and the banker says, well, this will do it. I'm going to forgive your debt, but I ain't going to forget about it. We're, gonna, we're still going to charge you interest on it. But you can't do that. How can you charge me interest on a debt I no longer have? That's absurd. One more time and then we'll move on with the sermon. Because I'm still laying my cards on the table here. If someone comes to you, Mr. or Ms. Christian, and says, please forgive me, you are required to forgive them. Now let me bring up a third objection. Well, what if they don't mean it? I don't think they really were serious. I don't think they were really sincere. I don't think they really meant that they were sorry. Guess what? It does not matter because guess what? You are not the arbiter of people's hearts. You do not get to interpret people's hearts, nor do I. We do not. Only God sees their heart. We do not. All we can go on is what they say and what they do. If they come and they say, I'm sorry, please forgive me, we must forgive. If they didn't mean it, guess who's going to hold them accountable? Someone who is a, 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 an authority that is far, far greater than us will hold them accountable. Okay? So, now that I've laid my cards on the table, let's look at the text. I didn't want you to go into this one and mm, I wonder what he's saying or I wonder what he thinks. Now, I want to divide this text into two areas. It seems to naturally divide into two areas. The first is the nature of forgiveness and the second is the illustration of forgiveness. Now that's a simple sermon for me. All right, Usually four or five points, right? This is two. The nature of forgiveness and the illustration of forgiveness. Now there will be sub points, so I'm sorry to disappoint you on that. But it's okay. We're going to be okay today. So let's talk about the nature of forgiveness. The nature of forgiveness is such that it must be infinite. It must be infinite. What does that mean? That means that there is no limit on how many times you must forgive somebody when they come to you and say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Now, Peter brings this up to Jesus. I don't know why he brings... And there's some really interesting speculation why he did it. Remember, remember this whole setting is that <clears throat> the disciples were arguing about who would be the greatest in the kingdom. Who's going to be the head guy? And Peter, in chapter 17, was getting a lot of attention. The, the, the people in... Uh, their, the, the hometown, Peter's hometown, his kind of headquarters area, the place where they stayed, the disciples stayed, had come to Peter and said, hey, does your master pay the tax, the temple tax? And so Peter was kind of getting, he was moving out front as the leader of the disciples, just maybe naturally, or maybe he was kind of just assuming that authority. You know how people are. People, some people are natural leaders. Some people just naturally assume they ought to be the leader and just take that role. And it was causing some issues probably in the, evidently it was, because they were arguing about who would be the greatest in the, in the kingdom and, and who's going to have what role and things like that. And so maybe Peter's getting some grief from these disciples and possibly he's, he's thinking, hey, these guys need to be forgiven. I don't know if that's the case, but and maybe it's just that Peter is the leader and maybe they were asking, go, go ask the master. Maybe they were just debating, having a theological debate about forgiveness. And Peter goes up to him and says, hey, how many times do we have to forgive somebody? Now you need to understand that this was a very common theological debate in Jesus' time. And even before that. And there were opinions on this. There were people who wrote 
papers on this. They didn't really write papers, but they issued declarations on it. And those people were the, the various rabbis. And most of the, the head popular, really highly respected rabbis had said that people must forgive three times. And they take that from Amos. The book of Amos, where, where at the beginning of the book of Amos, uh, the Bible declares that God had issues, I think it was with Assyria, I'm not sure, you can ask Brother Jim after, but with somebody who was doing wrong, and God said, three times I've forgiven you, three times you have offended, and yet a fourth, and on the fourth time, I'm bringing the hammer down. That's what God says in the book of Amos. One, two, three, forgive, 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 I've forgiven you, I've forgiven you, I've forgiven you, and now you're going to get the hammer. And so the rabbis will said, they reasoned this way, they said, well, nobody should claim to be more gracious than God, so if God forgave three times and not four, then we should not be considered or not be held accountable for, for forgiving more than God forgives. So three times. And that was kind of the, the lead argument. You understand? You know, you know how these theological discussions go and debates go. Me and Brother Jim and Chris and others, we, we like to argue and debate these kinds of things. And that's how it was then. So Peter comes to Jesus and says, Hey, Lord, now I want you to understand what Peter did. Look how magnanimous Peter is being. He probably feels like he's one-upping the rabbis. Because he doesn't go with three, he doubles it to six and then adds one for good measure. And says not three times, but seven times. Lord, how many times should we forgive? Not three times, but hey, how about seven times? And I guess Peter probably thought Jesus was going to say, Whoa, man, Peter, cool your jets, partner. Just three is enough. Or maybe he thought Jesus was going to say, Peter, you are getting, you are my A student. You're my best student, Peter. You're so great. Not three times, but seven times. Peter, you are awesome. Well, what does Jesus say? Nope. Try 70 times seven times. What does that mean? What did Jesus mean? Did Jesus have a math book? I'm thinking of R.C. Sproul. This is what he said. I mean, I love the way he said it. Jesus didn't pull out the first century Jewish math book and get this number 7 times 70. And I'll be honest with you, I guess I should have calculated what 7 times 70 is. And I know there are people in this room um, that know exactly what that is. Katie probably already has calculated that number, and that's fine. But I don't know what it is. It's something that maybe, what, 100? 490? Thank you, brother. So you're saying, wow, what is significant about 490, 490, 490? That must be a special number. Nope, it's not. Because Jesus didn't mean 490. He didn't mean any other number. He meant infinite. He meant there is no limit on forgiveness. Now, if you understand the nature of forgiveness, then you can understand what Jesus is saying. Listen, I told you that... If you are a Christian and somebody comes to you and says, I am sorry, you must forgive them. And by forgiving them, you wipe out, the, you cancel the debt. You erase that debt. It is gone. It doesn't, you cannot charge interest on that debt. You cannot bring that debt to, 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 to bear on that person. It's gone. So if that is the case, if that is the nature of true forgiveness, then you can't ever get beyond one. Do you understand that? Let me see if I can break that down. If Tracy comes to me, let me reverse that. If I go to Tracy... And I say to Tracy, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? And he says, yes, it really hurt. But I love you, and I love Jesus, and I'm going to forgive you. And I say, thank you, brother. And I walk away, and the next day I do the same thing again. And I walk up to Tracy, and I say, Tracy, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Now, let me ask you a question. Is that one time... Are two times. 
that Tracy has forgiven me? One. It's always one. If it's if he truly forgives me, it can't, it's not there to multiply. It doesn't add up. So every time I go to him after being completely forgiven for him, I have a clean slate. And every time, it never adds up to seven. It never adds up to 490. It never adds up to two. And if it does, if, you, if Tracy says, yes, I'll forgive you, but that's two, then guess what? He didn't forgive me for the first one. Because it's still there. Do you understand that? If it's still there, he hasn't forgiven me. So you must understand the nature of true forgiveness. It cannot add up. It can never add up. Ever. That's why if I go to God and I say, forgive me for my sin, he never adds them up. In my mind, I'm thinking, well, this is the fourth time I've asked forgiveness for the sin. How many times is God going to forgive me? It's not the fourth time. It's the first time. That's why he says it's forgotten. It's canceled. That's incredibly important. If you truly forgive someone for one offense, then the next time they commit the offense is the first time they've done it. That's why Jesus said seven I'm um, not seven, but 70 times seven. And this implies that true forgiveness is intrinsic. It's complete. It's not superficial. That's why I'm talking about the nature of forgiveness. So if you have to keep a list of how many times somebody has offended you, you've never forgiven them. That's important for us to understand. I told you this is going to be a difficult sermon. That's a high standard. That is an unbelievably difficult standard to keep. Get to that in a minute. And then as if to underscore this statement that Jesus made, which must have really blown the disciples' doors off. I mean, they must have been like, what? What? 70 times 7 or 77 doesn't matter. It was more than 3. What's he talking about? He gives an illustration. So that brings us to the illustration of forgiveness. Now in this illustration, there is a king who is owed and it is assumed that the king has the right to demand payment. And there is a servant who is in debt. And the servant owes more than he could ever pay. But the king has mercy. And he forgives the infinite money debt and pays and gives the servant infinite mercy. Now let's stop right there and examine that a little bit more closely. All right? So in this parable, and you understand that a parable is not a real event. This didn't happen. Okay, This is Jesus using a story to make a spiritual point. And so Jesus gets to make it, uh, make it be whatever he wants to be. Okay, So there is a king who has a servant. The Greek word for servant is doulos. doulos. Uh, it can mean a slave. It can mean a bond servant, or it can be somebody who is just in the service of the king. And you need to understand that in that kind of kingdom, in an eastern kind of understanding of kingdom, everybody in the kingdom is a servant of the king. Some are very poor. Some are in chains. Some are slaves. Some, though, have a lot of freedom. Some serve the king as satraps. And these are probably wealthy people who do the king's business for him. You know? And the, the, the parallel in the Western world would be in medieval England or medieval France or medieval Spain where there was the nobility. 
Okay, there were the peasants and the nobility. The peasants, they didn't have any money, they didn't have anything. They didn't own property, they didn't have anything. They just lived at the mercy of those who had land and had money. Now the nobles, the nobility, these were the dukes and the earls and, and those kind of guys, uh, they had land and they kind of had that land at the pleasure of the king. He kind of let them have all that money because it served his purpose to let them have all that money. Well, in, and so it kind of, kind of, it was a mutually beneficial thing between the king and the nobility. The king took care of the nobility and kind of protected the nobility and kind of served as their hero and champion, whereas the nobility, they kind of took care of the king by giving him money and when he needed people, he would, they would give him people. So it was a kind of mutual thing. So this servant had a lot of money and he had a lot of the king's money and evidently he was embezzling the king's money or at least he was abusing the king's money. And so when the king calls him in and tries to settle up, does an, does a, 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 um, an audit of the man, the king realizes that he owed him a bunch of money. Maybe he'd stolen it or maybe he just wasted it or whatever. And Jesus says that the amount of money that this guy owed the king was 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents. You say, okay, he owed him 10,000 talents. What's the big deal? The big deal is that that's an impossible amount of money. It's, a, it's an absurd amount of money. People have tried to figure out how much money it is. Some people say, well, that was about $20 million dollars. In today's, uh, in today's terms. Some people say that was about $10 billion in today's terms. Um, John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul uh, probably got this from William Barclay when they said that it is more like a zillion dollars. I think R.C. Sproul said it was a gazillion dollars. What exactly is a zillion dollars or a gazillion dollars? We have no idea. It's an impossible amount of money. Uh, I, just so you would kind of know, I, I, I was looking into what um, uh, William Barclay uh, said about this. The term is actually a murion. Uh, so when it says that he owed him 10,000 talents, the Greek word there is myrion. That means 10,000, myrion. It's where we get the word myriad, myriad, you know, myriad, myriad amounts, My myriad, all right? Uh, 10,000 talents would have been more money than people could conceive of. Let me give you some illustrations here. Uh, I think this is from John MacArthur, but again, we were getting all this information from the same sources. I think this ultimately goes back to William Barclay, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the total revenue collected from Galilee was 300 talents. In other words, the tax revenue in the first century from all of Galilee, that was that geographical area that Jesus lived in, was 300 talents a year. Uh, the total revenue collected by the Roman government from Idumea and Judea and Samaria. That's a whole big area of Israel, uh, including Jerusalem, was 600 talents, okay? Um, the tabernacle, you remember when the tabernacle was built? The Lord said, I want you to overlay all these elements in pure gold. You know, the Ark of the Covenant and all these other things had to be overlaid in pure gold. Um, and think about how beautiful and how magnificent that tabernacle uh, must have been. And you know how much it costs to do all of that? 29 talents of gold. Um, when the temple was built, they used 3,000 talents of gold. Um, when the Queen of Sheba came and 
demonstrated her wealth to Solomon. She gave him 100 and ta 120 talents of gold. And this is 10,000 talents of gold this guy owed the king. Uh, another interesting point about the Greek term uh, myriad or myriad. Um, uh, let me see, make sure I'm saying Myrion, Myrion. Uh, in the book of Revelation and all through the Bible, it, well, there, there's this uses of tens of thousands or 10,000 times 10,000. That would be myrion times myrion. It is a phrase. When the Bible says that there was myrion times myrion of angels, how many angels are there? More than you can count. That's why Jesus uses term. It is a gazillion dollars. It is more, it is an unfathomable amount of money. There's no way that this guy could have spent 10,000 talents and there is no way, no matter how patient the king is, that this guy is ever going to repay 10,000 talents. It's just not going to happen. But what is Jesus talking about here? He's not talking about money. That's not the point of the story. Remember, this is a parable. It has a spiritual meaning. He's talking about sin. You and I owe God a sin debt. He's not interested in our money. We have a deficit of righteousness. How big is that deficit of righteousness? It is myrion times myrion. It is limitless. It is endless. It is unfathomable how much righteousness we lack. We are in debt. And we could never repay. And if the king, that is God, required us to settle accounts with him, we would be without hope. That's our situation as unbelievers. That's why we are completely uh, we are completely dependent on a righteousness that comes from Christ alone, a righteousness that we could never have. He had to give us his righteousness in order to be right with God. That's what, that's what Jesus is talking about here. This deficit of righteousness. And what did Jesus say the king did? The king was about to throw him in prison and, and his family. and It was just about to be over for the guy. But the guy said, please, please have patience with me. Please don't do that. Please give me mercy. Show me grace. And the king did. The king said, all right, you are forgiven. I just wipe the slate clean. You are Understand, just like we just said, the king's not going to come back to him next year and say, hey, um, give me the interest on that myrion of myrions. Not going to do that because the debt is gone. Now, if that would have been somebody who understood what just happened to them, they would have been skipping along and running around and grabbing everybody and say, I owe the king an unfathomable amount of money. I owe the king a debt I could never repay, and he forgave me that debt. Praise the king. I love the king. The king is awesome. But that's not what he did. He went and found another servant who was probably below him in rank. And this guy didn't owe him 10,000 talents. This guy owed him, what was it, 100 denarii? Not very much money. 100 denarii? That's about three weeks or three months, rather, worth of money, of wages. That's not very, I mean, it's a significant amount of money, but it's not unfathomable. It's not an impossible amount. It's not a gazillion. It's a very reasonable amount of money. 
And the guy says to him, this other servant says to the forgiven servant, I don't have it, but if you'll just be patient with me, I promise I'll pay it. And what he should have said was, look, man, I just got forgiven of 10,000 talent debt. You just take your time. What he really should have said was, it's forgiven, don't worry about it. But at the very least, he should have, just take your time. Whatever long it takes, don't worry about it. I'm good. That's not what he did. He grabbed him around the throat and began to choke him. He says, you pay now. If you can't pay now, you're going to the prison. And he threw him in the prison. And when the other servants heard about what happened, they go to the king and they say, hey, that guy that you just forgave that unbelievable debt, he goes and finds one of his other servants, fellow servants, and that guy owed him a far lesser amount and he couldn't pay and so he threw him in jail. And when the king heard that, the king said, oh, but uh-uh. And called him back in. And he said to him, hey, partner, I just forgave you this unbelievable debt. And instead of, uh, instead of that changing your heart, instead of ha that having a, a, a change, causing a change in your nature, you go out and you grab this poor guy and you have him thrown in prison because he owes you this insignificant amount of money compared to what you owe me. Guess what? You're going to prison and the ESV doesn't indicate it, but other translations do. I'm going to give you over to the what? Tormentors. You're going to be in pain. You're going to pay for that. It's going to cost you. Wow, that's pretty harsh. The servant did not share the mercy of the king. And so the servant is punished. And understand this, he's punished not because he owed the king money. He did not owe the king any more money. He's not punished for that. He's punished because he didn't share the king's grace. He didn't share the king's nature. Now, again, you and I owe an infinite sin debt that we cannot repay. If we receive mercy from the king, that means that the king wants to change our nature to be like his. We become a child of the king. If you and I come to the king and say, I have sinned against you, I have sinned, I am a sinner, I can never repay the debt of righteousness that I owe to you, but Jesus Christ paid the debt for me and has given me his righteousness and I depend on that, will you forgive me? And say, then the king says, you are forgiven. And the king says, not only are you forgiven, but you are now my son or daughter. You are now one of my own you now share my nature. And it changes us from one kind of person to another kind of person. We are translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. We become a child of the king. We receive the king's nature. And the king's nature is gracious. Now here it is. Listen to this. Get this. Write this down. Therefore, if we belong to the king, we will be gracious. We will be forgiving. That means if we aren't gracious, if we don't show forgiveness, we don't belong to the king. Which means we still owe our sin debt. Which means we don't have a new nature. Which means that when we die, we're going to go to the tormentor. As children of the king, we must be ready to forgive when someone asks us every single stinking time. Why? Because that's what the king does. That is the king's nature.
And it's interesting that this comes right after the section on what to do when somebody offends you. Jesus said, if somebody offends you, go to your brother by yourself. And if your brother repents, what do you have to do? Forgive them. And if that's the case, you won your brother. You don't just go to your brother and say, you've offended me, and I'll never forget it, and I'll never let you off of it, and I just wanted to come here and let you know it. Now let's go to church. <laughs> that's absurd. That's crazy. No, you go to your brother, if, it forgive, if he repents, then you forgive him. And, it, and maybe you have to forgive us something, you have to repent of something too. And that's most of the case. Because most of the time, there's a little bit of sin, there's a little bit of need to repent in everybody. If your brother says, no, I'm not going to repent, go with two or three other people. And if he repents, great. But if he repents, you forgive him. And if he won't repent there, you take him to the church. And maybe he'll repent to the church. And if he does, you forgive him. By the way, the young man who was committing the heinous, immoral, sexual sin in 1 Corinthians 5, guess what he did? He repented. And guess what the church in Corinth didn't do? Because they never got anything right. First of all, Paul said, had to tell them to throw him out in order to discipline him. And then when they did and the guy repented, they wouldn't take him back in. They wouldn't forgive him. And so Paul has to write back to him and say, Hello. I almost said a, a word that I shouldn't say. Dummies. <laughs> he repented. That was the whole point. Take him back in. Forgive him. The word I was not, that I was going to say that I shouldn't say was not a bad word. It was idiot. <laughs> Not like I'm up here cussing in my sermon or something. I don't want that accusation going around. I know all of y'all were going, writing that down in your notes. He was going to say a word. What was that word? I've got to know. <laughs> it was worse than dummy. In my mind, idiot is worse than dummy. That's the Wendell Reed school of morality. <laughs> Listen to me, friends. Listen to me. Listen to me. This is what Jesus is talking about. We have to forgive. We are obligated as children of the King to forgive. And when you forgive, you completely wipe the slate clean. And if they offend you again the next day, it's really not the second time. It's really the first time because you've already forgiven the other time. So there's no list. That is why we have been forgiven 70 times 7 by our King. And that is why we must forgive the same way. And if we don't, then we will not receive forgiveness according to Matthew 6, 14 and 15 in Jesus' prayer. And James 2, verse 13. We're not going to get forgiveness if we don't forgive. Now, here's the application. What's the application of this and we're done? How can I forgive like that? Realistically, Rusty, how do you expect me to do that? Uh, in his commentary on this text, John MacArthur talks about a story in the Los Angeles Times. It's probably an old story. I don't know, but it doesn't matter. This happens every single day. But he talks about an interesting article from the LA Times. The headline was, Couple Meet and Forgive the Slayer of Daughter. And the article says this, I'm reading from Dr. MacArthur's commentary, we love this special person from the bottom of our heart. That's what they said about the guy that killed their daughter. We love this special person from the bottom of our heart, said Miss Bristol, of the man who murdered her daughter. The tiny housewife from Dearborn, Michigan confessed to a little nervousness as she spoke to a group of inmates in the prison chapel of the California Men's Colony. She and her husband Bob had driven 2,000 miles to see this special person, Michael Keyes, 
who was convicted of murdering their daughter Diane. The body of Diane, who was then 20, was found in San Diego's North Park area. She had been selling encyclopedias door to door when she was kidnapped and strangled. The Bristols, I'm still reading from Dr. MacArthur's commentary, the Bristols said God led them on a mission of forgiveness which prompted their friends and loved ones to shake their heads because they couldn't understand. We harbor no hatred and no revenge, Miss Bristol told the 60 prisoners Saturday night. We know God can make something good out of this pain. Miss Bristol said that when she and her husband received the devastating news that our daughter had been raped and brutally murdered, it was like a knife into the depth of our souls. We have the normal reaction of grief and anguish, of grief and anguish. Keys, who had first admitted to the Bristols that he didn't quite understand their act of forgiveness, told his fellow convicts that people like the Bristols give meaning to the word forgiveness. Then choked by emotional tears, Keyes turned to the Bristols and said, God bless you folks, and threw his arms around them both. What would make us happiest, Miss Bristol said, is when he accepts Jesus Christ. The San Diego judge who sentenced Keyes to life imprisonment said, Keyes was cunning, calculating, and callous, the most vicious killer I have encountered in my career. Ms. Bristol said, we view this man as one of value and worth. We are interested in him as a person, not for what he did, but for what he be can become. Now seriously, how can, how can I expect you to forgive like that? How can I expect myself to forgive like that? Now remember, at the very beginning of this sermon, I put everything on the table. I put my cards on the table. And I said that every time someone comes to you and asks for forgiveness, you have to forgive. And if you don't, as I labored to show you through the Lord Jesus' illustration, if you don't forgive, then you are not forgiven. You've not been forgiven. I told you this was a hard sermon. And you, some of you are looking at me like incredulously. And I understand that completely. You're telling me, Rusty, that if my, someone murders my daughter, like the Bristols were murdered, and I don't forgive the person who did it when they asked me to forgive, then I am not a child of the king. I've not been forgiven. That's exactly what I'm telling you. Precisely what I'm, but it's not me that's telling you. It's Jesus who said it in unambiguous and clear language. I wouldn't tell you something like that. That's Jesus who said that. And so we come back to this question for the application: How can we do that? How can we possibly get to that point? Understand this: that would be that would require a very serious process of grace for me. I'm sure it required a very serious process of grace for the Bristols. How did they get to that point? How did that happen? Well, let me tell you what I think. I think what happened was they have been redeemed. They have received mercy and they realized the weight of their sin. They realized that the sin they were guilty of, the debt of righteousness that they owed to a holy God was unbelievably and incalculably more great than the debt of sin that was done, owed to them by this killer. In other words, they realized that their offense to God was incalculably greater than the offense that this killer had committed against them. Now you think about that. And every believer in this room has to admit that that's the truth. Every single one of you has to admit that we have wronged God a gazillion times more than someone who killed our daughter would have wronged us. We have, we have offended a holy God far greater. 
That's the first step. We need to feel the weight of sin that we owe God, this debt that we owed God. We need to feel that. We need to understand that. We need to realize that the grace that we received from God is infinite in value. You understand that your sin is the reason that Jesus Christ, the holy, perfect, innocent Son of God, died on the cross. You are guilty of that. What greater sin is there? I don't care if it's Hitler. I don't care how many millions of people you've murdered. You have not done anything greater than when you crucified the Son of God. You need to feel that. And, and, and friend, we don't feel that. So forget about somebody who murders your daughter. What about the person who lied about you or the person who slandered you or the person who spoke something bad about you or the person who did something what is the comparison there? You mean to tell me that you can't forgive somebody you go to church with? Because they sat in your seat? Or because they looked at you wrong? Or because they criticized you unfairly? Or because you... They didn't say hello or good morning? Friends, we've we got to think these things through. <coughs> yeah. you got to forgive. Because it's the nature of God to forgive. And if I am a God's son or daughter, then I have His nature and I realize that people must be forgiven when they ask for forgiveness. If I refuse to forgive, then I will not be forgiven. Because I've never trusted Christ to save me. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying that sometimes there's not a process. I'm not saying that we need to pray and we need help. And sometimes, you know, we need to um, have counseling. I'm not saying that we need to become a bunch of neurotics who all walk around all day long worrying about who we've forgiven and who we haven't forgiven. If somebody comes to you, listen to me, if somebody comes to you and says, I am sorry, please forgive me, forgive them. Otherwise, forget it. Don't worry about it. Move on with your life. It's the way it is. And we need to deal with this. And it's a tough sermon. But it's really very simple. Not really a lot of theological complexity to it, is it? It's just tough. How do we do that? We do that by the power of God's grace. We, we forgive them. By, by the, His grace and mercy, we're able to do it. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this text, although it is difficult for us to fathom how to forgive people who constantly offend us, who constantly sin against us. But I pray that you would help us to see that because of your grace and mercy and because of the nature that you've given us, we are fully capable by the power of the Spirit, by the power of Christ who lives inside of us, we are fully capable of forgiving as Christ is forgiven. Help us to do that in Jesus' name.